evening, everybody. It's five o'clock on Tuesday. Time for some calculus too. Got some cool stuff today. Uh, last time we looked at definite integrals to do area. Now we're going to look at definite integrals to do volume. So we're going to do a couple different examples. Um, we'll start off just doing the volume of a, a three-dimensional figure. I just want you to see that. And then we'll move into uh, volumes of revolution, which creates some pretty cool curves. Um, so we'll take a look at that graphically and, and uh, see how we can set those up. And I'm going to definitely try and uh, save some time for you guys to, to work on a few problems as well from the, from the uh, textbook. So um, at the end of class, I'll remind you of a couple things, you know, we are starting to get close to the exam, you know, a couple weeks from third, two weeks from Thursday. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned it before, you do not have to take it during class time. You can take it outside of class via Proctor U. I'll, uh, I'll go through a couple of those things in the last few minutes of, of class today and see if there's any questions. But without any further ado, let's get into using definite integrals to find volume. Now, in the online lesson, the very first page, uh, it, look, it shows how to do a cone and a sphere. We're going to do one of those just to go through it together to see what kind of questions there are. And then um, leave it to uh, you guys to look at the video for the other one. So let's do, uh, let's do a sphere. You know, we did a triangle and circle last time. I'm only going to do one of them this time because I want to get onto some other stuff today. So let's talk about how we do the volume of a sphere with a definite integral. As always, pretend like my drawing is round. So now we don't just have a circle, we have a three-dimensional sphere, all right? You're gonna see it's very similar to how we did do a circle. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the i slice. Now remember the idea behind this. The idea is that I'm making this slice, so come on here, just to kind of give an idea of what that looked like. So there's our i slice, and we're making it so thin that we can assume that those sides are vertical, all right? Um, we can do this on a set of axes. Don't have to, but I think it, it helps us see the relationship. We'll say this is a sphere. Let's, let's do it in general. A sphere of radius r. Okay. So now what we want to focus on, you know, we've got this slice right here is some distance from the y-axis. So maybe we'll call that x sub i. And, you know, this part here is some distance from the top of our sphere. And it's kind of up to us. We can call this y sub i, or we can call this y sub i. Let's do it this way. Let's call this y sub i so you can see how this will play out. Um, because, you know, if we're calling this an x and a y coordinate, that would make more sense. So up here, this would be r minus y sub i. Uh, if you have questions as I'm going through this, feel free to ask. Now, the idea is the same as last time, except we're not looking for the area of the ice slice. Since what we want is volume, we're going to look for the volume of just the ice slice. We're going to focus in on that slice. Well, it's got some height of delta y. And if we think about what that slice looks like, if I were to pull it out and draw it just a little bit bigger. So this is our zoomed in, not to proportion, i slice. Notice what kind of shape we have here. You know, we know, we know this is x sub i. 
we know this is delta y. We have basically a cylinder. So the volume of the ice slice is the volume of this cylinder, which is the cross-sectional area, right? If we were to pull, look straight down this thing, we basically, this is the top-down view of this. X of I, you know, our, our cylinder would kind of continue down that way. So we need the cross-sectional area, which is the area of this circle of radius X sub I. So pi times X sub I squared, and then times the height. So times delta Y. So there's the volume of the I slice. Now our goal is going to be to sum up all the slices that make up the whole sphere. But there's something we should notice before. What do we notice at this first step that we have to change, that we want to fix before we start to put it in a summation or a definite interval? We talked a little bit about this last time. And then, like I said, this is something I want to be automatic. That when you guys are setting up a problem, you notice it. There's a, one thing we want to make sure we take care of first before we go any further. What do we notice? So at this point, a, a little alarm should be going off in our head because we have two variables in here, delta y and x. So we would like to get x sub i in terms of y so that this is all in terms of one variable. I mentioned this because you're gonna see this in a lot of the problems that we do. So we need some sort of relationship between x sub i and y sub i. Well, we have one and it's very similar to the relationship we did last time. So we take, if we draw a line from the center out to the edge of our sphere, well, that's a radius length, so that's r. We know that this length here is x sub i. This length here is y sub i. So from our Pythagorean theorem, we know x sub i squared plus y sub i squared equals r squared. We want to sub in y sub i sub out x sub i. So I, x sub i squared equals r squared minus y sub i squared. We actually don't even need to go any further because we have x sub i squared right there. There is our substitution. So the volume of the i slice is pi times r squared minus y sub i squared delta y. And so now we'll do this this time because it's the first time we're doing it today, but I won't bore you with this every time. The volume is approximately equal to the summation from i equals one to n of this basic Riemann sum, r squared minus y sub i squared delta y. Well, if we wanted to make these exact, we want infinitely many sub intervals. So we take the limit as n goes to infinity. And what that allows us to do, two things. Number one, this is no longer approximation. We can now say equals. Number two, we can use a definite interval pi r squared minus y squared dy. Look, notice the sub i is gone because we've gone from the discrete case. In other words, a countable number of slices to the infinite case. We're gonna go through infinitely many slices from the top to the bottom of this sphere. The only thing we need left are our limits. And Notice y sub i is this vertical measure here. You can go all the way down to here and all the way up to here. Well, it can go down by a radius length, so negative r. 
up to R. And those are our limits. This definite integral will give us the volume of the sphere. We're gonna prove that in just a second, but before I go any further, any questions about how we go? Oh, I lost my square on it. Why? Sorry, this should still have a square. Any questions about the setup of this definition? All right, we're gonna evaluate this because we know the volume of the sphere. It's four thirds pi r squared, or pi r, four thirds pi r cubed, excuse me. So we have pi. Remember, r is a constant. It's like you know, if they said, you know, your sphere is radius three, r would be three. So the antiderivative of that is r squared times y. Derivative of y squared is y cubed over three. And this is going from negative r to r. So we have pi out front. Let's use brackets and we'll multiply the pi in at the end. All right, the first term, we have r squared times r minus r cubed over three. All right, so that's plugging in the positive r. Minus, <clears throat> now we have r squared times a negative r minus negative r cubed over three. All right. I did a good job of running out of room. So we're actually going to put this on another whiteboard. Actually, what we'll do is we'll erase that top view. I wanna keep it all in the same slide. Give me just a sec. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're going to take this guy. And we're going to just so we can keep it on the same slide. All right, come on. Give me just a sec, fighting with the tools here. We're gonna bring it around. All right, put it right here. So we got the pie out front, R cubed minus R cubed, over three for the first part, minus, now here, r squared times a negative r is gonna be a negative r cubed. And this will be minus, this will, negative r to the third is also a negative r cubed over three. So we have to keep track of what we're gonna do with all these negative signs. So first off, we have r cubed minus r cubed over three. Let's not do anything with that yet. Here, distributing that negative sign to there is going to give us a plus r cubed. Distributing this negative sign to here, a negative times a negative is positive. This is going to make it negative again. So minus r cubed over three. So, a couple of different ways we can do this, but basically we're going to have two R cubes, and that'll take care of this one and this one, minus two thirds R cubed. Well, two thirds, is, uh, excuse me, two is six thirds. Six thirds minus two thirds is four thirds. 
So there is our four thirds pi r cubed, which is the formula for the volume of the sphere. So we did this one in general because I wanted you to see how you can derive formulas for these things using definite integrals. In this case, we derived the formula for the volume of the sphere. <clears throat> now think about what we did. We took a slice. And again, we do the way we do slicing is we choose a slice that makes our object easier to deal with. So we choose a slice in this case, so the sides are straight up and down. It'd be very, it's a similar slice to a cone. We use a, a cylinder as well. The slice is arbitrary and we give it a constant width or height in this case. And then we uh, say, okay, well, let's put on some, uh, let's put on some, uh, some of the characteristics of this slice. Well, it's got a radius of x sub i, and it is y sub i above what we denoted as the origin. And then we focus on the volume of the i slice. So again, it's this idea of slicing, taking something that is big, narrowing our focus. That's what allowed us to come up with the v sub i. Then we find any relationships we need to make sure these variables match. That was what we did here with the right triangle. Then once we have that, we set up our Riemann sum, which is our definite. Questions about this? Okay, like I said, uh, you got volume of tone in the, uh, in the online lesson. Make sure you take a look at those. You know, these there's always a question about uh, volume by slicing on the uh, midterm. All right, let's go into volumes of revolution. So volumes of revolution, let's talk about what they are first off. So I'm gonna be using this program here today. This is a nice program, especially for Calc 3. I use it quite often. I'll put that in chat. But we're not gonna be doing three dimensions. Well, we are doing a 3D graph, not that. So for volumes of revolution, you go to add to graph and we wanna add a surface of revolution. Now they've already got a couple in there and we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and use these. I wanna start with a basic example first though. Okay, so we're gonna start with this in the x, y plane. This is the graph of square root of x. We're gonna to add to this and look at some variations. So very first example, we're gonna take y equals square root of x. We're going to take the region above the x, y plane. So here's our graph square root of x. We're only gonna go zero to one. And this is our region. And what happens is when volumes of revolution, it gets revolved around an axis to create a 3D object. So here's what that looks like. You see it over here on the graph. All right, we get what's called a paraboloid that faces off to the right. Okay, <clears throat> let's, we're gonna break this down for this one. We're gonna talk about how slicing's involved, but we're gonna generalize that as we move on. So let's bring this back. What we do is we take a slice, okay? And I'll follow along on here as well. This is our i slice. Okay, well now that slice gets, whoops, sorry, I didn't do that. That slice gets rotated around and notice what it makes. It makes a cylinder, all right? So this ith slice gets rotated around. 
You can see why I'm using the 3D plotter. It makes a much better image than I do. That gets rotated around. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at just the i slice. And then we'll generalize. Well, the i slice has the shape of a cylinder. So the volume of the i slice, well, it's going to be equal to the cross-sectional area times the thickness or the, the height here or the width, whichever you want to call it. Well, because we make all these slices have the same width, that's going to be a delta x because we've got x in the horizontal and y in the vertical. Now, the other thing we need is to figure out basically the cross-sectional area of our slice. So if I were to pull our slice out, here's our slice. We know that its height is delta x. What we need is the radius, because then we know how to do this thing. So we're looking for the radius of the i slice. Well, notice what the, what it does. It's the distance from the y, the x axis up to our function. Okay, so this is happening at some x sub i. Well, this is then some y sub i. And again, guys, so I'm gonna uh, we're gonna look at this. I want you to see where it comes from, but then we're gonna we're gonna show you some ways to do it without having to go through all these steps. So that means this guy is y sub i. So the volume of the ice slice, y sub i squared, delta x. Let's get, let's forgot pi, because it's a cylinder. Pi times y sub i squared, delta x. Now, just like we've talked about before, Here's our discrepancy in variables, right? We want to integrate with respect to x, but we've got a y in there. So we need the relationship between x and y. That's going to be the function, which is right here. So the volume of the i slice is pi times square root of x sub i squared delta x. Absolutely, we can simplify this. We always want to simplify it as much as possible. Pi times x squared delta x. That's the volume of the i slice. Well, then that's going to give us the volume as a definite interval. So pi times x squared dx. And the last thing we need are our limits. Well, x is going here from 0 out to 1. and that integral will give us the volume of this 3D region that we had on. Let's take off our rectangle for a sec. The volume of this solid is going to be given by this formula here. Questions about this so far? Okay, we're not gonna go through this every time. What we can do is boil this down to just identifying the radius or radii, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, let's add another graph. Let's turn off the rotation. Let's add in x squared, okay? So here is, Here's our region. Let's clean, let's go to this. So now what we're gonna do, and we're gonna look at several different ways of rotating this region around different axes, all right? So we have two functions. And we're gonna use the same two functions for all of it. Y equals square root of X, Y equals X squared, First thing we're going to do is we're going to do the same x-axis rotation that we just did. 
but let's do this. So there's y equals x squared. And in comes y equals square root of x. Now there's a natural area bound between these two or natural region, because that's going to be the first thing you want to do. Get your 2D graph and clearly identify your region. Now what's going to happen is this is going to get rotated around the x-axis. Now, if you notice the difference in this one, now the, the uh, inside is not completely full. So you might hear it referred to as the disk method versus the washer method. What we did the first time when our bottom graph was zero, this would be called the washer method because the whole thing is filled in. And all we needed was the radius of the, of the curve. Now, this was what's known as, excuse me, this is the disk method. The, the washer method is when that inside is empty. Let me show you why that is. All right, so. Whoa. I think I just lost my whiteboard. Oh, good, it's still there. Whew. Would not have been happy about that. All right, here's why, the, here's why this one is called the washer. Something a little different happens when we take our, our um, slice and we rotate it around. So here's our slice. When that gets rotated around, now I have that open center, which is creating that opening in the middle. And so it creates a washer. Here we'll put it on, let's put it on this guy. So if we rotate our uh, rectangle around, see how it creates a washer instead of a full disc? So that's why this is called the washer method. The other one's called the disc method. There's only a small difference between the two. When we did the previous problem, when it was just under square root of X, Basically, all we had to do, let's, uh, let's write it up here. Basically, all we had to do was do the integral of, oh, let's just go back to it. We just had to do the integral of the radius squared. Remember, this was basically, this basically functioned as our radius. Now, we're gonna have two radii. We're gonna have one that goes all the way to the outside curve and one that goes to the inside curve. So basically what happens is we take the volume of the whole thing and crack out the volume smaller. So let's talk about that, what that would look like in the two integrals and then we'll break it, uh, we'll break it down. All right, so here is my big radius. So it goes all the way from the x-axis up to my curve. Let's call that big R. I also have a smaller radius in here that goes from my x-axis up to my smaller curve. Call that little r. So here's what's happening. I'm going to do the volume under the, the big one. So that would be pi, oops, be consistent here. So right now we're doing the volume under square root of x. We already know what that looks like. We've done it before. But it's gonna be pi times big R squared dx. We're going to subtract out the volume in the little one. So pi, times little r squared dx. Now we're gonna need limits on these. And notice in our curve here, there's a naturally bound area between x equals zero and x equals one. So those are gonna be the limits of our integral. The limits come from, uh, come from your region. 
So that's why it's so important to draw your region. Well, because these have the same limits, I can put them in the same integral. So, putting them together, there is, there's always going to be pi in there. So, I'm going to move pi to the outside. Big R squared minus little r squared dx. Now, the only difference between what I'm doing right now and the one we did before, little r was zero. Otherwise, it's the same thing. And we identify these the same as before. It's based off the function. So big R went up to the purple curve, which is square root of X. So it's gonna be square root of X squared. Little r right here goes up to the blue curve, which is X squared. And that integral will give us the volume of this solid right here. So we have two things, you know, we have two things that are pretty similar. You know, we've got the disk method, which is gonna be pi times the integral from A to B. Again, it'll be based on your region of your radius squared BX. I, I like putting pi on the outside, you don't have to. Washer is pi. And your limits are squared minus little r squared dx. All right, guys, don't think of these as two separate formulas. The disk is the washer method with the little radius actually just being zero. We're gonna look at a couple more examples of these because I wanna get, get really beat home the idea of how to pick out the radii. But this is all that's going on. It's basically we have a, uh, our, our slice is a, is a cylinder, sometimes with an open middle. Uh, that would be the washer, no open middles, the disc. So that's where the radius squared's coming from in the pi. And then we just incorporate our limits. Any questions at this point? All right, let's go around some different axes. Cause that's uh, what we need to talk about is how to identify the different radii. So we're gonna go around the line y is negative two. Look at how this changes our region. We're, should, it didn't change our region. Why didn't it? Huh. Sorry guys, this should have changed the region. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not missing. Right now it's rotating, it should be rotating around this line down here. Uh, hmm. This does not appear to be working properly. Okay, well, let's get away from that for right now. Um, Cause it doesn't change what we gotta do. We're gonna use the same functions. Y equals square root of X, Y equals X squared. We're gonna go around a few different horizontal and vertical lines, all with the same, okay? So let's uh, color code these. Once you get good at these, they become pretty, pretty easy and fun to do. So there's y equals x squared. There's y equals square root of x. And our region is there. We know they intersect at one comma one. We're gonna need this because we can also go around the x-axis, which I'll show you here in a second. All right, I was trying to do around the line y equals negative two. 
happen. So let's make that happen. So down here is the line y equals negative two. All right, so our region is gonna be rotated around that like so. Okay, clearly we have an open center, so this is a wash. All right, so here's our goal. We have to identify big R and little r. So big R is going to be from our outside curve to our axis of rotation. All right, so that's going to be big R. Little r, real similarly. Just to keep these things straight, is going to be from our curve to our axis of rotation. That's little r. So as we go to write this up, we already know the format. Volume is pi. We know for this one, you know, x is going to go from 0 out to 1. So that's staying consistent. 0 to 1. It's always going to be the bounds on our region as if you were doing area between curves. We know it's going to be big R squared minus little r squared dx. The only thing we have to decide is what is big R and what is little r. Well, think about what we knew before. We knew that the distance from here to here was the function. That would have been square root of x. So what are we doing? We're adding 2 to it. So big R is square root of x, and what do we make? Is square root of x, and then plus two, not under the radical. Real similarly, little r, we know from here to here, would have just been the function. That would have been x squared. So we're adding two to it. x squared plus two, squared, dx. That's it. I mean, yes, we got to compute this thing by hand to be a little messy, but we have set up the definite integral to calculate the volume of that region that would be created revolving this around the x-axis. Questions about that? change our axis of rotation. Same curves. Watch this. Let's do y equals 2, which would be a line up here. All right. Now, it's still going to have an open center. But some things have changed as far as our big R and our little r. That's going to be our big R because the purple is my outside curve. This is going to be the little r, because that's my inside curve. So volume is pi. We still know it's, it, the limits don't change, guys, because it's still the same region. The only thing that's going to change is our integrand. Big R squared minus little r squared, dx. Now, this one, be a little careful, because let's talk about what we know, just like last time. Now here, we know this distance from the x-axis to the curve, the purple curve, we know that distance there is x squared. So now what's happening is we're actually gonna have to subtract x squared off from this whole distance here. It's kind of like two minus x squared gives us r. And let me know if you have questions about this. It's going to be a little tricky the first time you see it. So 0 to 1. 2 minus x squared is our big R. Our little r is going to work out really similarly, right? Because we know that this distance here is square root of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 2 minus square root of x to get that little remainder. And um, I, I, 
I'm drawing pictures in every one of these that we do because to me, that's the key. That's by the picture is how I'm deciding the radius. Questions about either of these two? All right. Let's revolve one around the y-axis and then, uh, then we can try some. This one, see if any questions come out. Because there's only one extra step in that case. We'll use the same two curves. Y equals square root of X. Y equals X squared. So here's square root of X. Excuse me, that's X squared. And Here's their square root of x. OK. Now we are going to rotate around the y-axis. All right. So this is going to be our axis of rotation instead of the x. So we're coming around this way. The biggest thing, here's the biggest difference. Our slice now goes this way and has a delta y instead of a delta x, all right? That's the only difference. But that does mean we need to integrate with respect to y instead of x. So we're going to need the inverses of both of these functions. So in this case, we're going to solve for x, right? So let's uh, keep the colors the same. So that would be x equals y squared is the blue curve. And for this guy, x equals square root of y. Because we're going to need the curves to be in terms of y now. But the steps afterwards are the same. Notice that if this thing rotates, we're going to have an open center. Because there's the outside and then there's the inside. So we've got a washer. So right off the bat, we already know that this thing is going to have the form of pi. Always, don't forget the pi, always put that in. There. Big R squared minus little r squared dy, okay? Now, one thing I wanna point out, and it won't be really obvious, this, because this intersects at zero, zero and one, one, our limits now need to be y values. So I'm gonna use the y value at each point. It just happens with the curves that I have that it happens to be zero, one. But realize that those are, those are the y values this time, not the, uh, not the x values, okay? It just so happens that because of where these intersect that um, we get exactly the same limits. That normally won't happen. So make sure when you're integrating with respect to y, you use the y values of the intersection. You're integrating with respect to x, you use the x values. All right? OK, guys, only other thing we have to do is identify big R and little r. Big R. Big R is going to go from the outside curve to our axis of rotation. That is just the function in terms of y. Well, for the purple one, that's square root of y. So, square root of y is going to be our big radius. Our little radius goes from the inside curve to our axis. Our little, our curve, our blue curve is y squared. So minus, sorry for all the colors. Keep getting the change back. That will give us the volume of that solid. So just remember, if you're going around the vertical axis, you want to do it in terms of y. A horizontal axis, you want to do it in terms of x. We can do the same thing as last time. You know, say we want to go out here. X equals negative three. Okay. 
and we want to revolve all the way around this. Don't make it hard, you know, don't make it too hard. All we need are the big R and the little R. Sorry, I know my drawing's getting a bit messy. Big R, it's right there. It's the function plus three. Little r, right there. It's the function, which is this distance, plus three. So the volume in that case, limits don't change. Always gets multiplied by pi. Our big R is square root of y plus three squared. Our little r is y squared plus three dy. Oops, sorry, it's squared. So with these volumes of revolution, um, and you know, I know it's going a little quick there at the end, but it's because I wanted to give you a chance to try a couple. Um, that's what you, that's all we need to look at. What I want you to do is I want you to draw your region. Uh, good question, John Paul. Um, John Paul asked if, we, if we'll do anywhere our axis is a linear equation. We won't be doing that um, this semester. It can be done. It gets a little bit, uh, it's interesting, but it's a little outside of where we're, we're heading. So we won't be, we'll only be doing either a horizontal or a vertical axis of rotation. So guys, when you're working on these problems, here's the things I want you to take away from this, uh, from what I was doing. Number one, very clearly draw and shade your region because that's where you're going to get your limits from and your big R and your small R, if there is a small R. If the small R is zero, set it to zero. Identify your big R and your small R, put them into either the disc or washer with your limits. And uh, we're gonna do a couple from, from the uh, book, from the activities in the book. So there's the book there. And for time's sake, I only want you to set them up. So you can use technology to calculate them. Then what I just put into chat is the answer key for all of them. So I have Symbol Lab up so that once you set one up, like this one I got here in line three, just put that into Symbol Lab and check out the answer. If it didn't work out, call me in. Let's figure out why. All right. But I wanted to give you, we've got about a half hour, maybe a little more, to at least try one or two. Um, I'm going to try putting you in, in pairs. Let's see how that goes. Um, any questions about what I'm going to ask, what I'm asking you to do. So here's, and here's some problems for you to try from the book. I'll put these in uh, the breakout rooms as well. But I want to give you guys a chance to try these. Like I said, here's, and follow those steps. Draw the graph, identify your region and endpoints of your region. Find your big R and your small R if there is one. Put them into the formula to set up your integral. Check your integral and send them. All right. Questions?